Hello. Hi. Welcome to Intro and History of Luda Fashion, otherwise known as EGL Fashion. Um, the EGL stands for Elegant Gothic Lolita, which we're going to get into a little bit later. Um, but today we are going to talk a little bit about the history of Lolita as a fashion, the different trends, as well as how it got started. Um, my name is Opsix Pui. I have been into Lolita fashion for around, well, I've been in the fashion and in the community for around nine, nine years. Um, and I primarily wear Gothic and Kuro Lolita. And I'm Pyrrhus Maiden. I've been wearing Lolita since 2006. I'm not going to count how many years that is because it'll <laughs> be old. Um, but I primarily wear sweet, classic, ish. It's it's hard to describe. My I mostly wear kind of older Lolita fashion because that's when I got into the uh, sub style, and that's kind of what I'm into. Um, and so, as of six we said. We're going to talk a little bit today about um, the trends and cultural forces that led up to the creation of Lolita fashion, and then we'll get into a little bit of what it is today. Okay, so we're going to start from um, before Lolita fashion was in existence, the kind of precursors to, precursors to how it started. In the 1970s, there was a trend, not just in Japan, but um, kind of I want to say it's also starting in probably the U.S. for Edwardian, yeah. like a neo Edwardian revival, which is where you see all the gunny sacks, young, young Edwardian style like prairie dresses, um, kind of cameo style jewelry. Um, yeah, it was it was a trend throughout both the U.S. and Great Britain, um, kind of popularized by brands over here in the U.S. by uh, companies like Gunny Sacks, Young Edwardian, and Candy Jones. Um, overseas in the UK, Laura Ashley was the main driver of the brand. And it was very focused on a return to a feminine, floral, kind of delicate and Victorian inspired um, style. Think uh, Little House on the Prairie. Yeah, yeah, I imagine like walking through meadows. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so this actually, this trend came over to Japan, you know, in part from the popularity of these fashions overseas. And then apart from the popularity of the American show, Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> and so that trend made its way over to Japan. Um, and beginning in around the 1980s, um, Japanese brands started putting their own spin on it. Um, in Olive Magazine as kind of a big marker of that. It started out um, actually as like a kind of Cosmo type magazine. It was only a Cosmo type magazine for three issues, and then it rebranded itself as Olive Magazine for um, romantic girls. And they highlighted a kind of romantic and feminine styles loosely inspired by the Edwardian revival trend. And um, Olive's style, you know, spans a couple of decades, um, but at the beginning, it encompassed a lot of elaborate, layered, um, I guess you would say they were almost like frumpy or dowdy prairie type looks from brands like Pink House, um, Denaneshi or Rural Poem, and Street Organ, as well as kind of preppy and cute British, British traditional, um, that's the word they use, not mine, <laughs> um, from brands like Vivienne Westwood and then in Japan, Milk. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. A uh, couple things to also kind of keep in mind is this, this is all happening after like several anime, I believe, were also like um, the Marie Antoinette one. Um, Rosa Versailles. Rosa Versailles, because that was also in like the cultural lexicon. So like this idea of like romanticism, like femin femininity. <laughs> Romantic right? femininity. Yeah, it's still a largely popular anime today, but like that's kind of where you get like this kind of idealization of the prairie and Victorian. Yeah. And at what point does natural K come in? Um, so natural K is kind of concurrent with olive. Um, it, it, natural K is like a, a sub style that many people consider to be the precursor of Lolita, which I think is accurate in some ways and not so accurate in others. Um, but it's natural K in Japan is primarily known as Kaneko K or Pink House K, and it focuses on clothes from the brand Pink House. And they are like the big, like Japanese prairie style brand. So there are like the standard Pink House coordinate. It's traditionally like 
you wear a blouse on the bottom and then you wear a skirt over your blouse and then you wear a dress over your skirt and blouse and then you wear a cardigan over your dress and then you wear another dress over <laughs> the cardigan. Like it's very layered, very intricate, lots of details. All of the clothes have tons of rows of pin tucks and ruffles and lace. It's the height of kind of over the top, almost like a caricature of femininity and it's very cute. Mm -hmm. um, and so this pink, pink house starts kind of makes its name because it starts getting featured in Olive. And originally it's not pink house style or natural K. It's um, the girls who wear pink house are called Olive girls because they're Just wearing the name. Olive magazine. I know, I, I want to be an Olive girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Olive's, uh, Olive and pink house, their popularity is really hard to overstate. In the 1980s and 1990s, it was the primary fashion style for high school and middle school kids right. who are kind of the drivers of a lot of Japanese fashion trends because they're yeah. the people with disposable. So, yeah, when we think about like street fashion and we think about like the little fashion as how we think, um, you know, in terms of like it being more of like a subculture today, we think of it being like, oh, it's like not popular, it's a little bit niche, but that's not the case for Olive Girls and that magazine. Yeah, it was, this was like the look that everybody was going for. Um, even though Pink House's clothes are, uh, their dresses can run up to like eight or nine hundred dollars for some of the fancier pieces. Um, and like the average skirt costs like three hundred dollars new. Um, so it was definitely an investment, but it was the look that everybody was dying to have in the 80s and 90s. Um, and in 1989, um, we get, I think, what are more generally recognized as the actual precursors of Lolita fashion when Cutie Magazine debuts. And it features kind of a cuter, more of like a Six, it's like a cross between, I guess I'd say British traditional and like, you know, which is basically like British schoolgirl style. Um, and then like kind of 60s mod, like put those together. Um, and that's the style that Cutie is pushing. And it heavily, Cutie heavily promotes Japanese brands like Betty's Blue, um, Jane Markle, Milk and Hardy, all of which have been around since the seventies or the eighties. Um, and those are the brands that really lead, are the first Lolita brands out there. Um, and Cutie is also generally recognized, just fun trivia, as like the originator of the street snap phenomenon. They would go out into the streets of Tokyo and take snaps of the readers as models to show what real girls were wearing on the street. Yeah. So here we finally reach the actual beginnings of Lolita fashion. And here are a couple of the brands that were the kind of like um, first ones to be like the foray into the fashion. Yeah, so milk is like generally recognized as kind of the grandfather of most uh, Japanese street fashions and Lolita is no exception. It was founded in the 1970s and um, its designers, their focus has always been on, you know, not designing what is cool or trendy. They focus on, they design for kind of the idealized milk girl who's like a cute girl who kind of has her own idea about what's cool. Um, Shirley Temple followed in 1974, and it was uh, actually founded by a former milk designer, as a lot of the brands on this list were. Yeah, um, that happened so much. It, Shirley Temple uh, is a kid's brand, but it was super popular in Japan with teenagers and young adults because their largest kid's size is like, you know, an adult small. Yeah. Um, and they're, they start featuring, um, you know, dresses with like the really poofy skirts and um, Milk and Shirley Temple in like the 80s and 90s start putting out original prints, which are another hallmark of Lolita fashion. And then when we get into later into the 70s, we have Angelic Pretty, which I think is probably the most popular brand right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they open in 1979 as a select shop or a boutique carrying other brands like Milk. And then Rural Poem followed, uh, or Dena Neshi in the Japanese, but Rural Poem is kind of like the romanization of it. Um, follows in the late 1970s, and they're kind of, uh, they start off as a natural K brand, um, but they morph into making more of a straightforward Victorian baby doll style, you can almost say, that's the forerunner to a lot of modern classic Lolita fashion. Mm -hmm. and, and I think most people know this, but Angelic Pretty started off being named Pretty, so you do sometimes still find those items like with the Pretty label in it, which is um, rare and sought after. If you see any items like that, send them to me. <laughs> um, 
And then in the 1980s, we start to see the establishment of brands that are more str- that are not just like Lolita adjacent, but are considered Lolita in their own right. Um, with Jane Marple being founded by another former milk designer in 1985, and um, their early British take on the British traditional style, which at this point is basically like a knockoff of Vivienne Westwood, was the groundwork for what most people consider the origins of modern Lolita. Um, Baby the Stars Shine Bright follows in 1988. And then um, Part E also follows that same year. And I haven't seen much about early Baby. Um, Their old pieces are extremely hard to find and they're hard to spot because they haven't changed their tag since 1989. Um, But Part E, it's easier to find their older pieces. And they're, um, they're kind of, they start off making pieces similar to Milk and Jane Marple, but by the 90s, they branched out into their own style and started making pieces that we'd recognize as the forerunner to modern Sweet Lolita. And by the 1990, by the early 1990s, what is widely regarded as the groundwork for Lolita style is pretty well established. Brands like Milk, Shirley Temple, and Jane Marple are not only established, but they're big enough that they can afford to print their own custom fabric and create pieces with cute, detailed custom prints and lace. Um, And they've also started to make bell-shaped skirts, accessories like lacy wrist cuffs, and hair accessories like big lacy headdresses and giant head bows that hadn't really been seen yet and putting it all together to make the early Lolita looks. Right. So kind of before, just to kind of summarize all of this, before we have like the advent of what we recognize as Lolita now, we've got Natural K and that kind of goes, uh, undergoes like, you know, not like tra- transformations, but like it, it does evolve kind of, kind of into Lolita. But even so, what was Lolita at the time is not necessarily something that many people, perhaps if they are newer, would recognize as Lolita today. Right? Yes, the, the looks are much, uh, now there's a big focus on tons of accessories, heavy makeup, big fancy hair. Um, But in the 80s and 90s, that wasn't the focus. Usually it was, you'd have a blouse with a jacket over it, a skirt, generally pretty short, maybe not that puffy, maybe not even a petticoat. Um, You would have some socks, but they might not have lace or a fancy design. It could just be simple knee socks. Um, Maybe a couple of accessories like a necklace or a ring or a bracelet, but nothing huge um, and lots of lots of simple hair, lots of no to little makeup, just one or two head accessories. Um, The looks are very toned down versus what you see today. Mm -hmm. And similar to how Natural K was and still kind of is, there's still that kind of feeling of like frumpiness rather than being like extremely put together. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really the biggest difference between a lot of older and newer Lolita styles is Mm -hmm. there used to be a certain degree of what I would call like acceptable frumpiness. Um, and now there's much more of an emphasis on being put together with everything matching head to toe. So that's really changed in the last 50 years. Wow, okay. <laughs> Time is a flat circle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna talk about a little um, about Lolita becoming more of a popular fashion um, in the sense of it is coming into its own right, in, in like um, establishing itself as a subculture and fashion. Yeah, it's moving from something beyond um, just what kids on the street are wearing and the way that they're combining pieces from their favorite brands to being a style that's memorialized and- and Super recognizable. Yeah, like, and it's become, there's becoming more of a codified and um, specific look. And so throughout the 1990s, um, the fashion starts to increase in popularity through uh, through being featured in print media. Cutie keeps featuring items from Lolita brands. Um, in 1997, um, Fruits is published and it featured street snaps of real life teens wearing Lolita fashion, although notoriously the guy who uh, does Fruits actually hates Lolita and he bitterly regrets the fact that his magazine made it so popular because he does <laughs> brand driven um so fun fact um and so at caro which brings us actually to the next point so kerouac or kara 
um, was first published in 1988, and they um, it was like a general. So fruits was just street snacks. Mm-hmm. Kara was like a traditional fashion magazine. They would tell you about events that were happening, new releases from brands, um, and then they also had a street snap section where they heavily featured gothic and lo- gothic lolitas, and where they featured gothic lolita and lolita brands in their pages. And then um, in the media, so idol group, people who are maybe more into Japanese 90s idol music than me might know this, um, but through first uh, the idol group Fairy Tale and later through uh, one of its members' solo efforts, Mizuno Aoi, um, she was super into Lolita. She wore brands uh, like Angelic Pretty or Pretty um, Milk and then Garaus, which was like an early Lolita brand. Um, And her fashion inspired her fans to dress like her as well. Um, And then the 1990s also created another wave of Lolita brands that we are still with us today. Mm -hmm. Um, And Metamorphose is founded in 1997, where uh, while the designer is in fashion school and she is selling her pieces at select shops and boutiques and to her fellow students, which I find really cute. That's adorable. I love that. I know. My, well, my favorite bit of, so my favorite bit of Kato-san trivia, Kato-san is the designer for Metamorphose. Mm-hmm. My favorite bit of trivia is that she, uh, she really wanted to be in a band, um, but she couldn't make any money being in a band. So she <laughs> was like, well, crap, I got to go to school for something. Um, and so the two options were designer and chef. And she thought about being a chef and she's like, well, if I'm a chef then my hands are going to get all chapped and ruined and it's hard to make it as a female chef in Japan, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's it was still sexist, sexist and it's still sexist, I think. Um, and so she was like, so I was just like, well, could I'll be a designer. <laughs> um, and then in 1998, Innocent World follows and they're one of the main classic Lolita brands today. And mm-hmm. Victorian Maiden um, follows the same year. They originally start off as more of a Gothic Lolita brand, yes. but they now are kind of one of the primary classic Lolita brands. And then Emily Temple Cute follows in 1998, not 1989, sorry if it's wrong. Um, they actually originally started in the 80s as a subline, uh, like a teen line of Shirley Temple. Um, like Shirley Temple would make the baby clothes and Emily Temple would make like the older kid clothes, basically. And um, in 1998, they're spun off as their own independent company and they start producing because Shirley Temple's prints were so popular. And the adult fans were like, wait, why can I buy these clothes for my kids and not for me? Like, guys. Um, and so Emily Temple starts making Shirley Temple's prints in grown-up size. <laughs> yeah. And something to know about, like, when we talk about substyles is that we're talking about, like, how we would see the substyles from, like, today's point of view. But at the time, I believe it's a little bit more debatable about, like, what sub- substyles, like, existed or yeah, were just... So- terms for like very general terms for things right yeah so actually in the 90s so this is interesting stuff that i found while doing my research for this um in the 90s actually the jane marple milk like british traditional meets sweet lolita look that was considered the only acceptable lolita look there was a lot of debate over whether brands like rural poem which were incorporating more of a victorian influence there was a lot of debate over whether they were lolita um, and the same with some of the more gothic brands. There was a lot of debate over whether that was even considered Lolita. And there were a lot of purists who into the even later 90s were like, oh no, like that gothic stuff, that's mm-hmm. not really Lolita. Um, or that classic Lolita stuff, that's not really Lolita. And it's not really part of the fashion. Um, right. so, these, so I think Jessica's right. Like we're kind of talking about it like in with the benefit of hindsight, being able to see like this brand took an inspiration from this older thing. And then we can see how that developed into today's substyles. But at the time, it was just these brands were doing these things um, and they weren't even always calling themselves Lolita. Oh, well, up until the late 90s, right? Was, right. I think when Lolita becomes more solidified. And then that's when brands start referring to themselves as Lolita. Okay, so speaking of Gothic Lolita, we are going to talk a little bit about how, like, kind of gothic makes its way into this kind of substyle, style the style that has primarily been very like doll inspired very floral very like um you know not not gothic um so yeah visual k is um primarily a music-based genre of i guess 
it's it's a music genre, but of course it's fans and it's artists are wearing kind of clothing that is um, inspired by Western goth, um, Western rock um, and glam rock. And so they're very, um, very elaborate and costumey, I guess is a word that- Because they're stage costumes. Yeah, like stage costumes. costumes. So, and like, we don't say that, I don't say that disparagingly, that's no. just what these clothes were. They were- people would wear on stage. And yeah. then the the fans of the Stone Road music would attend the shows um, wearing similar clothes inspired by the artists. Yeah, because there's always been a big overlap, but historically there's been a huge overlap between Lolita and um, kind of band girl culture mm -hmm. in Japan or like people being, you know, big fans of underground bands. Um, like in Cutie, you know, there was like a whole section like basically devoted to like snapping like band fans at like concerts in their, in their cute outfits. Um, and this kind of continues into like the visual K where as the, um, as artists like, you know, as these male musicians wear um, these over the top costumes and fans start cosplaying them, um, the band's style starts to trickle down into fashion. Um, and that becomes more explicit when Mana of Malice Mise, is it Malice Miser or Malice Mise? I always said Miser, but I think someone else said Miser at one point and I was like, oh no, I have been wrong for my whole life. Um. <laughs> yeah, I apologize to any Mana fans, uh, I have no idea. But um, he, Mana established, he was like one of kind of the biggest figures of early Lolita as it's becoming established. Um, he founds his fashion brand, Moi Même Moitié in 1999. And they're widely recognized as being one of the first uh, explicitly gothic Lolita brands. Um, and his clothes combine the 90s Lolita silhouette with 90s like Victorian inspired goth. Um, and it, it's hugely popular because Mana is a popular artist and he has a, a popular lot of guy. Yeah, so <laughs> people rush to basically copy, you know, instead of having to make their own copies, now they can buy the Mana sanctioned ones. And people are really excited about that. Um, and it's Mana- so different from today. I know, yeah, basically it, things <laughs> haven't changed. It just stuff why. <laughs> um, and Mana coined two new terms that we still use today to describe certain types of Lolita. Um, he calls his one site the more uh, traditionally like masculine silhouettes of like pants and yeah. aristocratic. or like androgynous kind of a yeah. little bit more adult yeah uh so he he called like this is more of like the straightforward like victorian romantic goth side mm -hmm. he calls that elegant gothic aristocrat and then um for the more cutesy lolita side is uh, elegant gothic lolita yeah and would you say that there was necessarily um I, I would say that like before before this, there was already like the gothic elements being pushed into Lolita. But, you know, when he coins these terms, this is, this ends up like what he, is, he like popularizes this like concept of like yeah. this more gothic style within the Lolita fashion subculture. Yeah, I think that's a very fair way to put it. I think Mana often, sorry, Mana, he often tries to like tout himself as the <laughs> creator of gothic Lolita, but, it, it, you know, history kind of shows that those, the looks that Mana was wearing were kind, it was like a symbiotic relationship, you know, he's inspired by what other people are wearing, and they're inspired what he, by what he's wearing, and it, like, turns into this kind of new thing over time, um, but he really just popularized something that was already there and had been there for a little while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely without um, his brand and his influence, it the, what we think about Lolita and Gothic Lolita wouldn't be what it is today. Yeah. Okay, so now we have reached to um, the 2000s, which is where Lolita really, really starts to take off um, as a fashion subculture. Um, yeah. Um, and it, it kind of takes off, uh, actually, as a result of Mana's influence. Thank um, you, Mana. <laughs> Good job, Mana. Good job. <laughs> 2001, Mana approaches the publishers of Kara with a proposition. Um, he's like, Gothic Lolita is so popular. You're giving it so much space. Let's make a whole Gothic Lolita magazine. Um, and he calls it the Gothic and Lolita Bible. And it's basically like a 17, but for Gothic and Lolita folks. Um, Hot so tips. 
it, like it features information about like cute restaurants you may want to go to. There's like shopping guides for Tokyo. Mm -hmm. There's information about, you know, new brand releases, styling and lifestyle tips. Um, there's, a, there's a group of artists and authors who are kind of coming up as well, who uh, are working, who focus on Lolita. And so the magazine heavily features art and literature from these artists, um, one of whom is one of the most popular um, is Novala Takamoto, who's the author of uh, Kamikaze Girls. And the magazine is very heavily promoted by Visual K artists, kind of leading to this continual feedback loop of like Visual K influencing Lolita. Um, and then Lolita's, you know, influencing Visual K artists right back. Um, and popular artists like Aya of Psycho Le Samu. Samu. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce any of the Visual K band names. I don't know anything about Visual K. Uh, but Aya, Munkana, and Mana, and some uh, and other artists um, very heavily promote the magazine as well, which really massively increases the popularity of the fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing to add to this is I. I'm not sure how much of like this kind of lifestyle, like how like Lolita's and Gothic Lolita's should be like living their lives was a concept before the magazine. But definitely I would say like they are telling people, you know, like, like these are, this is like the way you should be acting. This is the way you should be like wearing your clothes and where you should be going. And, you know, here's some recipes and, you know, that kind of thing, even to the, sometimes to like a bit, bit tongue in cheek the cheek there is that that um pretty infamous um gothic the beets. Lolita, the, beets. The, the, the the pickled it's the, so the, the whole thing <laughs> what six is talking about is there's this so the gothic Lolita bible does a lot of the time like very straightforwardly present and kind of codify information about lolita culture um to the point where it kind of starts to like poke fun at itself and i think the fifth it's the fifth issue yeah um, there's this infamous spread among kind of, you know, among those of us who've been around for a bit, um, like, where it's like- The difference they, like, between sweet and Lolita's and gothic Lolita's, right? No, it's just, so it's like once, it's like a two page spread and one side is a day in the life of the sweet Lolita and the other side is a day in the life of the gothic Lolita. And they're both like just, you know, little like photo spreads, like trying to sell, you know, different dresses from brands. Um, and the sweet Lolita, she wakes up at 7 a.m. and then she makes cookies and she goes to her violin lesson and she has a teddy bear tea party and she's in bed by eight. And then at midnight, the gothic Lolita wakes up and she uh, goes to a show, comes home, reads some tarot cards, eats some pickled beets and spam <laughs> for dinner, and then goes to bed in her coffin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which to add to this, um, in I think 2000, the year 2000 is when um, Victorian Maiden actually did sell a coffin yeah. as like an item you could buy from the brand. So and so by like this basically by this point, like issue five comes out in I think two thousand two or two thousand three, something like that. And so by that point, Lolita fashion is already codified enough that the main magazine can poke fun at you know stereotypes that people have about Lolita, Gothic Lolitas, and Sweet Lolitas. Um, and in two thousand two. Um, Shimotsuma Story or Kamikaze Girls by Novala Takamoto is published. And this kind of further codifies the idea of like a Lolita lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The lead character Momoko is like a, she's like a hardcore sweet Lolita. She yeah. only cares about sweet Lolita. There's one scene. She only eats sweets. Yeah. And she only eats desserts. Which sounds <laughs> gross, but. <laughs> And, you know, there's like one kind of famous scene where she's like, you know, talking about how she's going to die and be buried alone in her frills. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's like very individualistic as like a character. And I feel like a lot of people looked up to that, looked up to her as like this kind of sweet Lolita, like individual, like individualistic, like, you know, strong minded um, heroine. Yeah. A lot of people look up to Momoko as basically like being able to disregard the opinions of society and just being able to focus on like what she loves. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's published in North America in 2006. Um, and it is like really hard to overstate the influence that uh, Comic Cause Girls, the book and the movie had on like Western Lolita. Like, the book and movie single-handedly made Baby the star shine bright, which is like Momoko's favorite brand. Um, it single-handedly made that made it the most popular Lolita brand um, all over the world for a few, a good few years. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then kind of on the North American side in 2001, um, the EGL Community on Life Journal is created. And it's um, basically like a one-stop shop where people at first, where people can go, like you can buy and sell Lolita, you can learn about new releases, you can learn how to, um, you can learn how to get Lolita pieces because at the time there was no, like most Japanese brands didn't even have websites. There was no way to find out about releases unless you had a friend in Japan, like taking pictures and emailing it to you. So it was like a place- You can buy any of it, yeah. Yeah, so this, so EGL is like a place where you can basically learn like, okay, what is Lolita fashion? How do I get the look? How can I make that look from pieces that I can actually obtain? Um, and it spawns like, way too many other live journal communities for like, play, you know, meeting Lolita's in person, sewing your own outfits, sharing your outfits, buying uh, grab bags from brands and yeah. other things like that. Um, and so with the creation of EGL, that's kind of where the Western Lolita community really right. gets its start. And something to like keep in mind about the EGL Calm is that because this is kind of like a central hub of where all the Lolita's who, um, read and speak English, that, that's where they're getting a lot of their information. And there's not necessarily the most, um, there's not a ton of information that's like getting transferred between that group and what's happening in Japan. Like it's very limited, um, the, the amount of information that's coming through is like minimal. So there's all like opinions that people in North America and uh, other Western speaking countries have about Lolita as a whole that ha that that specifically come from this point in time in the EGL community. Um, and that's where we get like so many of our rules. That's how we get like what we think about Lolita as like a whole, um, because there are also like these like guides, these, um, you know, guidelines on how to be a Lolita this is like what the rules are, this is what you have to follow. And at, at the time I would say that because so many people wanted to make sure that they were do, like being the thing, do, being a Lolita, they, they, they wanted to follow these rules to the T, right? Yeah. Which is not necessarily how I would say Lolitas in Japan were. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, the way the Western Lolita community and the way the Japanese Lolita community arose are like very different. You know, the, the Japanese Lolita community, you find out about Lolita because you like a band or you see somebody wearing the fashion or you pick up a magazine and you like, there, you easily can find out like all of the places you can go to buy the clothes. You can easily access those places and you can buy your little dresses and call it a day. Um, in America, you know, the, to, I guess I'll use like the way I found out about Lolita as an example. I found about, out about Lolita in 2001. Um, it was like in a random blurb, like in a book about some like Victorian fashion. Um, and I was like, I start like frantically Googling and, you know, basically all I can find out about it are like a handful of pictures. There's maybe like a few scans from the golf, from like magazines, but not much. Um, there's nothing really telling me like this is where you go to buy Lolita items. There's nothing telling me this is what this is what a Lolita is. Um, so the Western Lolita community is basically trying to reverse engineer what they can from yeah. and copies of magazines. Um, and that's kind of it. And so there's like definitely a divide between the way that the community originates in the West and the way it originates in the East. And that definitely shaped the fashion in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even like the mindset that we have today in the Western communities about like, you know, getting together with like a bunch of strangers in groups that all wear the same fashion is not necessarily the case for Japanese Lolitas because they don't really need to do that. <laughs> You're Lolita with your friends, so why do you need to like meet a bunch of randos online, you know? Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> because people are more spread out and you have to like search really hard to find someone with similar interests, which is why we have like this you know, feeling of like, oh, like we need to have an interconnected like sense of community, not just locally, but a little bit more globally as well, I'd say for the Western comms. Yeah. Um, can we pause it for two seconds? Sorry. Oh, wait, okay. Let yes. me just draw I'll my just edit it out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, the cat was like <laughs> being a pill. 
he like was he didn't know where I was and then he came into the room and then he got mad when he closed uh, he closed the door and then he got mad that he closed the door. <laughs> of course he did. Give you a couple seconds of like a clean face. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am going to switch slides. So this brings us to, I guess, finally, what what the heck is Lolita? What is Lolita fashion? Um, That's what you're here to find out. <laughs> yeah, based on based on like all this stuff that we've said about how it came to be, what is it today? So now, you know, I think both in Japan and in the West, because Lolita is is established and has been around for. Um, I would, you know, I'd say in its current form for a little, for over 30 years at this point, um, there are kind of guidelines as to what makes an outfit Lolita versus not Lolita, although these can be kind of fudged a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and ever-changing and evolving. Yeah. Yeah. Like Jessica mentioned, or like of six we mentioned earlier, you know, the guy, the traditional Lolita outfit in the 90s that looks nothing like what we would say is like the traditional prototypical Lolita outfit today. Um, the guidelines are flexible and subject to change and they look different at different points in time. Um, but it, I think the one thing that's been like eh, kind of consistent, um, the traditional like building blocks for Lolita outfit are, um, you've got a flared skirt or a dress, you have a little petticoat underneath to make it poof. Mm -hmm. um, if your dress doesn't have sleeves, a lot of the time you'll have a blouse under it or a jacket or a cardigan over it. Um, and then you'll have, you know, something on your head, whether it's like Jessica's got a bow on today. I've got a little um, And then you'll have some shoes or socks that look cute. Um, you know, how they match your outfit, I think, kind of change is that's one of the things that's changed with time. Yes. Um, and yeah, like what, but I think what's like essential has changed over time. So we'll, let's get into like what kind of the traditional outfit for most period looks like, and then we'll run through like the way it's looked over time. Mm -hmm. so, okay, so here we have um, how it's, how uh, a, a couple images of how um, the precursors to Lolita. Yeah, so, so see, it's not, on it doesn't the, look recognizably. Lolita. Yeah, so this is like the precursor to Lolita. So on the, um, on the, let's we'll start on the far left hand side. Um, the image of the woman in the cardigan is from a 1985 knitting book published by a brand called Atsukiyo Nishi. And um, they were around in the 70s and 80s through like the early 90s. Um, and they, fun fact, the designer for Baby the Star Shine Bright was one of their knitwear designers before he moved on to Baby. And they were one of the first brands that really featured like intricate, detailed, fairy tale themed prints and kind of fantastical motifs like we see in Lolita, um, even if their silhouette wasn't always Lolita. In the middle, we have an image from Olive with two girls wearing pink house. And this I think is pretty like traditional of the brand's look. You can see they've got um, a floral jacket layered over a floral dress with a little <laughs> matching skirt peeking out from the bottom and then a floral hat on top. Um, that kind of head to toe, like matchy matchy, very overdone look with lots of frills and curled hair was the very typical pink house look in the 80s and 90s. And then on the far right, we have an image from Olive and this is an image featuring items from a brand called Coupe de Pied that was very popular in um, all it, in all of itself. Um, their style was kind of like a British schoolgirl type style. And they're like the forerunner of the Jane Marple milk British traditional look um, that was popular with early Lolita's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can see here, the silhouette looks a lot more similar to what we would think of as Lolita today. Yeah, I think this image is from like 19, I wanna say 1983 offhand. Um, but the the knee socks with the cute platform shoes and the bell skirt and then the, the cute little blouse and the little hat like that's if you walked into a Lolita meet wearing that today no, nobody would look sideways at you <laughs> yeah but if you for example showed up to a meet wearing this people would be like what are you doing but fun yeah. you know fun this is something that is the building blocks to the fashion that we know today yep. Okay, so here we have um Yeah, and so oh, just for like a quick yes, explainer. Yes. So we're gonna we're gonna take you through kind of what Lolita has looked like through the ages for the different um the different Lolita styles. Mm -hmm. 
um, which are, and the, the Lolita fashion, I, you know, you've probably like seen one or two pictures of it. Um, but in general, it's kind of divided into like three days. styles, three styles, styles. Uh, sub yeah. styles. Yeah. Um, and there's like, some people have more categories, some have less, but these three, like everybody agrees on. Um, there's classic Lolita, which is more Victorian inspired, um, Gothic Lolita, which is surprise, Gothic inspired. Um, and then sweet Lolita, which tends to be more cutesy and pop focused. Yeah. And there is a lot of, um, throughout time, a lot of intermixing between the styles. You know, you don't necessarily have to categorize your style as one or another. You can make, you can wear um, things that are pulled from elements of all each of yeah. them um, and also what defines these styles does change over time um, but this yeah. is these are the terms that we have come to know and use yeah like i think that's the uh, image on the far left is a good example i think if somebody wore it today you might think oh that's gothic lolita um, but jane marple actually kind of is the forerunner to a lot of like the classic and sweet lolita brands um, so um, the 1990 image is from a, sh a sh photo shoot that Cutie did in London featuring a lot of Jane Marple's clothing. Um, and this particular outfit is like a skirt with velvet panels and those crosses are like big appliques. And the big cross on her chest is like a necklace and she's got like a little beret. And you can see the same tight and platform shoe combo um, with the white petticoat sticking out to give her skirt the traditional bell shape. And then uh, the image from 1999 is from Rural Poem. This is an image from their last collection before they closed. Um, and you can see the very straightforward Victorian influence. The girl mm -hmm. on the right just looks like she might go to like a historical fair um, and hang out. You know, if anyone has ever yeah, gone to the, the bonnet. Right in with a little bonnet, right? <laughs> <laughs> and on the um, left, you can see they have a shorter dress that I think is more emblematic of the traditional um, classic silhouette. And then um, the third image is an ad, a 2004 ad from the Gothic Lolita Bible from Mary Magdalene. And they're kind of widely regarded as being like one of the big classic Lolita brands. Um, and you can see her outfit is a little simpler. She has like a little, um, it's like a little hat. You can't really see it. It looks kind of like a basket. Yeah, it um, looks like, a, like it's got fruit in it. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it's like a straw hat. Yeah. <laughs> She's got like a little straw hat and she's carrying a little basket, but her coordinates like overall very simple. It's just mm -hmm. a little hat, a dress, a, some tights and some shoes. And then um, next to that, we have a 2005 outfit from Innocent World. This is like one of their ex most popular and iconic designs. They've actually re-released it a few times. Um, and you can see kind of the continuation of the bonnet, um, you know, the Victorian bonnet look, but now it's coupled with kind of unique, uh, dress that looks like it's maybe inspired by like a 1700 stomacher with lots of like lace and bows and the little braids. So she looks very doll-like and cute. And, you know, this is all examples of classic Lolita, um, but also like between all the different brands, they all kind of have their own different styles. So you can see that um, even in the same like time period, 2004 and 2005 are pretty close. Mary Magdalene is known a little bit more for like simplistic streamlined designs, I would say. And Innocent World has like a little bit more of like embellishment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mary Magdalene is like, maybe like you're a cute Victorian teenager, Innocent World is like, you're a little baby doll, somebody <laughs> stuffed in a dusty attic. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a really good description. Um, and know. then yeah, this is a little bit more modern. Yeah, and so now we're getting a little more into like the modern day. So 2011, this is an image from Juliet at Justine. Um, this is their popular painting dress. Um, and this kind of sparked off a new trend. Um, the 2004, 2005 images, that was classic Lolita for a while. Mm -hmm. And then when Juliet at Justine came out with this painting dress in 2011, at first people were like, oh my God, this is so ugly. This isn't classic Lolita at all. And now I, to this day, I would say that's still kind of the main style of classic, right? Um, I mean, the well, classic is kind of funny right now. Classic, I would not say is the popular style. Um, yeah. So it is a little bit different yeah, maybe the, me... what people consider as classic. Um, yeah. But at the but time. Think, yeah, let me rephrase that. Maybe from like 2011 to 2015, 
15 or no, yeah. maybe, maybe even a little later than that. It's maybe until 2017 or 18, like yeah. painting dress style. Like that was. Yeah. Black painting clothes. dresses became such a huge thing. Um, you know, J- Jet J kind of popularized it, but there have been other brands that have done them um, since then. Um, and kind of also sparked this trend of digital kind of printing, like this digital imagery um, on skirts. Um, and also because Jet J became so popular, it they have a little bit of an eclectic style, I would say. A lot of people before this didn't really consider them Lolita. Um, but Western it, is, I think we should say. Yeah. Um, but it kind of kickstarted this like trend of a little bit more opulent styled um, classic where people would wear like bigger and bigger headdresses, bigger and bigger props, um, which wasn't typical for classic Lolita until until now. Um, at, yeah, you, at this point in time. Yeah, I think that's right. Like the you can see this in contrast to the earlier images, this 2011 model is wearing um, very heavy makeup. She has her hair very, sti- it, her hair is like obviously not natural and it's very styled. Um, this is kind of a preview of the way that classic just got started to get more opulent throughout the 2010s. And then in 2015, we have kind of a different side of classic, um, which is from Excellent Treek. And they were, they're a now defunct brand. RIP. I know, RIP. Their big focus was incorporating um, historical cuts and silhouettes and especially historical corsetry into Lolita. Um, and they're they're like, they've always had, were a little bit of an outlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's like also kind of another example of the way that classic Lolita has a whole spectrum of styles that have always been incorporated within it. And on the end, we have a look from Victorian Maiden last year. Um, and I think this is a pretty good example of like what the, maybe what the more popular classic look is today. Yes. It's still retaining a little bit of the opulence from the painting dress period. Like this model is wearing, you know, a gray wig, for example. Um, but it's also, you can see there's kind of incorporation of some historical silhouettes from like the 1800s and a focus on kind of some detailed print. So a little bit of everything from every mm-hmm. year. Yeah, I, I would agree that um, nowadays when people think classical, you know, they th- might think a little bit more dressed up, um, probably um, as a leftover of what we were doing in, you know, the 2010s, um, not necessarily as simple as, um, you know, previously, but you could wear any number of acceptable outfits and still have that be considered classic Lolita. Yeah, because Lolita doesn't, old stuff doesn't really go out of style the no. same way it does in traditional fashion. Like some people might not recognize your dress or recognize the brand that you're wearing, but Old Lolita still reads as Lolita to most people. Okay, here we have Sweet Lolita. Which I think has arguably undergone the biggest transformation. Yes, I would say so. Yeah, so on the um, on the far left, we have an image from Heart E in, the, in 1993. And this is like one of the earliest examples I could find that was kind of recognizable Sweet Lolita. I um, mean, you can see she's wearing a cute little blouse with a bow tie under, I think her jacket's like fur. And then she has a little bell-shaped skirt, but not much, if any, petticoat, a little lace, some tights, some cute platform shoes, a little beret, but not much makeup, no wig. Um, 2001, you can see it's kind of similar. Um, it, it does look a little more, a little less like regular fashion and a little more like something different with the yeah. addition of the wig and the apron and the platforms. Um, and she's wearing metamorphos, but it's still pretty, pretty toned down and pretty accessible. Mm-hmm. But I would say that what probably makes this more recognizable to like a modern day viewer is like the printed socks, the platform shoes, the headdress and the hair. Yeah. Like this is a very, the style she's wearing is a very recognizable style of old school Alita, especially. Um, and the 2001 to 2004 era, like if you are into anime at all, that's the most popular era for uh, manga and anime creators to draw their Lolita inspiration from. So you would you'll really recognize this look if you, this if you found out about Lolita through anime or manga. Which many people uh, do. <laughs> not, actually, I didn't. <laughs> I, so, I did. So, but yeah, no shame if you did. I think, uh, honestly, like, 
I'd say probably 90% of the Lolitas I know, maybe 95% mm-hmm. out of the anime or manga. It's very common. So um, in 2004, this is a screenshot from Kamikaze Girls. And the girl on the left, uh, Momoko, is the main Lolita character. And the girl on the right is her friend Ichigo. And the look that she's wearing, um, she's in the movie, like kind of the joke is that she's like a diehard baby, the Starshine Bright fan. And everything she wears is always from baby. So this is like a good example of what the brand is putting out. Um, You can see though, the style is maybe not too different from what we're seeing in 2004, still kind of natural colored hair, a small petticoat, a lot of makeup, simple colors. Um, Like she's, you know, she's, she's dressed up in something, but it's not, you might recognize it as unusual, but you wouldn't be like, whoa, it's that weird costume. Maybe yeah. well, maybe my mind has been rotted from too many years of life. I feel like I, I do I do feel like in, in the um, book and in the movie she is people are like what what the heck are you wearing? Especially just like given the location that she lives in, it's it's rural. That's her. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but this is probably the most popular era that um, people think of as I'd say old school. Like if they are a Lolita, um, because um, Baby has kind of come back and released these as their like classic designs um a few a good few times now like pretty regularly yeah and then I think on top of that like most Lolitas at some point or another see kamikaze girls and see that style and that's Mm -hmm. kind of you know that's what you see as old school um Mm -hmm. and then in 2006 we start to see a change um this is from Angelic Pretty and this is when they were starting to get more popular this is from one of their prints, Twinkle Mermaid. That was a huge hit, but this ad in particular caused a huge debate because people were like, wait, hold up, blue and pink wigs? Like, is that even Lolita? Um, and like now, you know, everybody wears wigs. Like, <laughs> But um, at the time, this was like extremely hotly debated. Um, people were saying this was like not Lolita. It was the ugliest thing they'd ever seen. They had no idea why Angel Pretty released it. Um, it was very controversial at the time. Um, but mm-hmm. it was also very popular. And it, it moving forward, th- at this ad, I think in particular, like marks a big turning point in how uh, Lolita is styled and designed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because before this, people would say that you can't wear a wig at all. Um, and if your hair is, in your hair cannot be unnaturally colored at all. Um, and so this was a huge like shock for people, especially in the Western community, because again, we're used to following rules. Um, and also something else to note is we're, we're seeing like the, um, the oncoming trend of border prints, which before this um, weren't really a thing. You had, um, you know, you had your plain dresses with lots of lace, you had, um, you know, printed dresses that were bought, um, like you'd buy a floral, floral print and then a brand and make a dress yeah, out like, of it. Yeah, like um, not not custom. And if they did have custom, it might be like an all over. But starting here, you've got the pastel colors. You've got the border print that's also custom. Um, they're a lot more simpler at this time than the ones that you see today. A lot of them were screen prints, um, just silhouettes. Yeah, this one in particular is like a screen print silhouette um, because, you know, a lot of the brands didn't for... Uh, when you're ordering custom fabric there's like a huge minimum order quantity at the time most of these brands are like super small boutiques they're not even making a hundred of each dress so they can't afford um the giant minimum order quantities that custom printing requires that like bigger more established brands like jane marple and milk can afford so they're stuck with like screen printing um and so when a more detailed screen print came out like this it was a huge game changer yeah, and by this time you can also see that they have the, um, you know, the tea party shoes with like the bow on it. Which um, I'm not sure when like the shoes became a thing, but I would like to say like before this, it was just like, oh, you wear like a chunky shoe. Yeah, but like the, so, tea party shoes in particular came out in 2005. Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> but in the early 2000s, you know, you have to remember most Alitas are like high schoolers or middle schoolers who are slowly starting to build their wardrobe. You don't have, you know, $200 just floating around that you can casually spend on a pair of colored shoes to match every outfit. So most Lolitas have one or two pairs of shoes in black or white that match most of their outfits. But as we move into the mid-2000s, Lolitas have been around in the fashion for like a decade. They've got jobs. They've got money. 
then we start to see the addition of more accessories and more detailed um, like custom shoes to match specific prints and colors. And something a little bit funny to know about, I guess, um, Kamikaze Girls is this, that bit in the plot where she's talking about like the perfect shoe to wear with any outfit is the rocking horse, um, the Vivian Westwood rocking horse um, platform shoe. Um, so at the time, you're not seeing like the flat Mary Jane kind of style necessarily. It's, a, it's still a lot more chunky. Um, but the plot in the book is that she, it, it's like a very expensive shoe. It's like $500. And so she like tricks her dad. She like tells her dad that one of her friends is dying um, and needs money so that he, he will give her money so that she can buy these rocking horse shoes. And you can still buy them today, but yes. they are $500. They're still $500. <laughs> All right, um, and so moving into 2000 and the 2010s, Angelic Pretty, uh, Baby is the most popular brand from like probably 2002 until like 2006 or 2007, at least in the West, because in the West you like really can't get Angelic Pretty. Um, but moving into the 2010s, you know, it starts to be a little easier to get overseas media. It starts, to, services start to pop up to allow you to shop from Japan. And so Angelic Pretty starts to become popular. And um, in the late late 2000s, early 2010s, AP is, it's really hard to overstate their popularity. Like people would buy dresses from AP just so they could sell them for like a thousand dollars, which is like almost four times the retail price. I don't um, know what that's like. That's nothing that's like what's happening today. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say it's different from what I've been doing, but, um, <laughs> but I think it, it, if you're coming back into the fashion now, but it's like AP was like the thing. Like if you were not wearing AP, people would be like, is that even Lolita? <laughs> like the the way that AP styled and designed their clothing was okay. seen as the only valid way to be a Lolita. And it was focused on lots of heavy makeup. You can see this model's wearing a big wig and a natural color. She has head to toe matching coordinate with tons of accessories like a matching bag, matching shoes, matching necklace, matching jewelry, a matching head bow. Um, and so it's much more ornate and detailed from the 90s and 2000s look. And um, that continues as we come into the mid 2010s with, uh, this is the second image from 2015, is another image from Angelic Pretty. Um, you can see they've kind of branched out from the handy sweet motifs um, and they've gotten maybe arguably a little more classic. I think this print was like a chandelier situation or something like that. They also discovered that crosses were a thing at some point and they started slapping them on everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, and so that, so it, for a while, in, you know, the mid 2010s, it was focused a lot on kind of soft pastels and soft floaty chiffons. And then we, uh, and that was only for a couple of years though. And then it's starting probably around 2018 and continuing on to today with those last two images, the 2018 images from Baby and the 2020 images from AP. Um, we went back to the candy sweet kind of image, um, but take we've also, I think, kind of gone back to our roots maybe almost with like hair and makeup where the makeup is still there, but it's toned down and a little more natural looking and the hair, you know, is the same. It's it's still styled, it's still cute, but the focus is on looking a little bit more natural and cute, even though you're still wearing these candy sweet prints. Um, so yeah. Yeah, kind of what, like going back to Classic Lolita, what Jet J did for um, Classic Lolita and, you know, kind of promoted this kind of opulent OTT style, over the top style, um, that's what AP did for Sweet Lolita. So you had this height of just, dramatic opulence like the most stuff on your face the most decoed nails like the biggest hair and the most like bright pastel colors people would criticize you for like not having enough accessories in your hair <laughs> and <laughs> the pinks didn't match you know from your socks to your head bow um so i remember dear stalker put out this video where it's like these two Lolitas sitting across from each other at a table and they're trying to like one up each other in terms of how many accessories they've got on their head. So they keep like pulling accessories out of like different places, different crevices, and like they would put like a star clip and a bow and another bow until like their entire head's like covered. And then they just, in this short film, they start just throwing cupcakes at each other because they're mad that 
um, like the, someone has got like accessories on their head. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That's, but that's kind of what it was for a while. And like, and now I think, uh, you know, one thing I will say hasn't changed with Sweet Lolita, AP is still, Angelic Pretty is still kind of the primary trend maker and they have been since the early 2000s. Um, their popularity waned for a little bit, but I'd say now they're back kind of arguably more in full force. People think you're not wearing Sweet Lolita unless you're wearing like AP Sweet, AP Style Sweet. Yeah, like, and it's got to be like modern AP styled sweet. Mm -hmm. So like, you'll get criticized if it's if it deviates too far. But I mean, also, I would say I mentioned people criticizing, but also I'd say I personally don't put that much stock in people complaining about what I wear, and I don't think you should either. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Right now we're in a huge sweet boom of um, people being really, really nostalgic for like these, um, like the cotton um, custom print, like from two thousand tens. Yeah, so that's what's going on right now in terms of Sweet Lolita. Which, kind of funnily enough, I would say pandemic had a little bit to do with it. I feel like it did, for sure. Because like, people were just like, we're going to spend our money on, like, just fun, fun things. I can't go outside. I'm going to buy a dress with gummy bears. I think I said to myself last month. <laughs> yeah, now let's move on to Gothic Lolita. So... In the 1980s, Gothic Lolita wasn't like super a thing. Um, it was, mo to the extent that it existed, it was mostly um, kind of overlapping with, it, it, to the extent that there was influence from the 90s, Gothic Lolita was mostly just Japanese Gothic fashion in the 90s and Japanese kind of visual K fan fashion in the 90s. Um, but I did want to share this image from the, from the 1990s, which is of a rural poem dress. Um, which was uh, off by basic by Moache and a couple of other Gothic brands um, subsequently. So you can see the the cuts um, and the types of dresses that people were wearing have their roots in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe this dress was re-released. The, the Moitié version was re-released by Moitié kind of recently as well. Yeah, there was uh, the original version is either 1999 or 2000. And then they did a re-release of it uh, just either this year or last year. I think it was called the Gardenia Dress. I think it might still be available for sure on the website if like that's your thing. So, um, and then the middle image is also from Wattier. Um, This is an image from when they opened their first shop in 1999 with the shop staff standing inside of a coffin. And you can see like, she's got heavy makeup, she's got a black wig, she looks like a little like gothic baby doll. Um, so the style is like already pretty well established by the time Watier hits the scene. And then 2003 is an image of Mana um, wearing his traditional uh, kind of white makeup, blue lipstick, Photoshop nose out kind of thing. <laughs> um, and I think this is a pretty good image too, like showing what was considered like good Gothic Lolita in 2003. Like I would have cut off my right arm to have that outfit in 2003. Yeah. And the way that um, Watier specifically styled their outfits, that was something that was um, also replicated by many of its wearers. So a lot of people would try to do like the spiky hair. Um, at the time, like the other substyles, like classic and sweet weren't doing very heavy makeup, but it was a little bit more acceptable to wear like this kind of more gothy style makeup. I, I would argue that Mata single-handedly told Gothic Lolita's you should wear blue lipstick. And we were all like, yes, I'm wearing blue lipstick today. I know, I, it, I admittedly, I so when I first found out about Lolita, you know, I was like an edgelord 13 year old. Uh, and so I wanted to be a gothic Lolita. I was like, it's the only way I gotta be gothic. Um, so I've definitely bought more lipstick than I care to admit uh, because of Mana's influence, even though it will never look good on me. <laughs> um, and also something else to note about like this 2003 image is that um, it is also an, an example, a really great example of a nun style outfit which is a very common motif in Gothic Lolita um, and um, has- It's like a visual case of Old Dover. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of other um, brands that have gone on to do, well, okay, go, go, um, I'm gonna stop myself. It was really popular in the early 2000s to have these nun looks. I would not say that like in between they were the most popular, they're actually, um, there is a, a move away from the more cosplay stuff. Um, so like 
people are like, oh, you shouldn't be dressing up as like a nurse or, oh, you shouldn't be dressing up as like a nun. As um, people who were not into visual K joined the fashion, there was a little bit of a backlash towards the visual K influence of like, that's just a stage costume. This is a fashion. You shouldn't wear things that look like a costume. So for a while, there was a huge backlash against like nun outfits, nurse outfits, anything over the top, and even to an extent like stuff in explicitly inspired by the way that Mona dressed. Right. Like, oh, you're just like a Mon Mona cosplay. You're not like a real leader. <laughs> like people would say that kind of thing. Um, yeah. kind I of think the real takeaway that you were accidentally imparting is that Lilidus can be kind of mean, which is sometimes true, but not universally. It's sometimes true, but also I would not, you know, you, you gotta, you, you can absolutely find like the, there's a sense of community. <laughs> I will say that most people in who actually participate in the community are very nice. Um, and most people don't tolerate people who are jerks and yes. kind of, yeah, but so mostly we're like, we're not trying to highlight the jerkiness. We're just trying to highlight the kind of debates in the community about what the definition of fashion is and how yes. it changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so there's like this kind of like movement away from more costumey, what they would call costumey styles of Lolita. And then at some point, I guess we are all just like, no, we would like to be nuns and nurses yeah, um, and in the last few years there's been a huge resurgence for more of these types of outfits yeah i would say it's our it's probably been within the last like three or four years that it's really like come back full circle which mm -hmm. somebody who like just got into lolita so she could be like a cosplay nun love to see it yeah um okay here we have this outfit from 2007 which i believe is atelier bones yeah it's boss um, and this is like a pleather dress, just to kind of give you, like Gothic Lolita kind of went through like, so in the early 2000s, like Mana, like literally cannot overstate how popular his style was. And then in like the mid to late 2000s, like early 2000s, Gothic Lolita is one of the most popular styles of Lolita. Um, in the mid 2000s, it kind of fell out of favor and brands were kind of like, what the f for a couple of years. Yeah, like we were afraid that the brands were not going to make it. Yeah. Um, and so brands kind of started putting out a lot of really interesting experimental pieces. I think this dress uh, is a good example. It has the traditional bell shape, but uh, it's got like an underbust cut with like a boob window um, and just like some little ruffles for accents. So it's like a very unusual, very mature style dress uh, for Lolita. Um, and in 2010, as you know, as over the top sweet Lolita starts to pick up steam and this painting dress over the top classic trend starts to pick up steam, this is see gothic start to change and people start incorporating you know wigs and makeup heavy makeup into their style but it's not um it's not the traditional mana pancake face it's more, <laughs> it's like a more of a on trend style of makeup kind of loosely inspired by um you know gyaru makeup like with the circle lenses heavy lashes lots of blush yeah. gyaru but make it like vampire yeah. <laughs> and then um, the style itself kind of starts to focus more on, um, I would say like fabric, like it becomes more of a focus on like the fabric, like lots of, lots of satin, lots of yeah. lace, lots of lace up corset elements. More, much more detail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. More of it like a construction detail and fabric focus than a print focus and that we see in Sweet Louis at the same time. And then 2018, um, I, this is an image of the gardenia dress I mentioned earlier. I forgot I had this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is the original. This is the This re is the copy. Sorry, Mana. Didn't mean to call you out. But uh, <laughs> this is the 2019 re-release. And I think we can see how the style has kind of started to come full circle. Um, you know, she's wearing this dress that was released in the 90s and again in the early 2000s. She's wearing a big lace headdress um, of the style that was popular in the early 2000s. And she's also got some big platform shoes like would have been popular in the 2000s. But um, this model, I'm not sure if you can see it in this picture, but her style is a little more modern influence. She has long hair um, and kind of more of a, a heavy makeup that's like on trend for today. Um, so it's kind of melding, bringing back older styles and melding them with things that are popular today. A little old and a little new. Yeah. So yeah, I would say in terms of Gothic Luda, it what it started with is kind of this really like, um, popularized by Mana streamlined look where it's very like architectural gothic like even influenced by gothic architecture um a lot like less frilly 
than its counterparts. Um, and kind of in the mid and later 2000s, it gains a lot more like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, we've again come back to being very nostalgic for the gothic Lolita of the past. Um, right now, what Sweet Lolita is experiencing in terms of people really wanting to buy um, items that are from like, the mid 2000s, um, Moitié is also experiencing that. There is a huge um, amount of people are reselling Moitié for like crazy prices. Yeah. Um, and I think overall, there is actually a big, I would say across all the step styles right now, there is a big resurgence of interest in older styles. Um, when I first got into the fresh, well, when I, let me rephrase, in the 2010s, it was considered very passe to wear old style Lolita. And a lot of people like didn't necessarily, there was debate over whether it was still Lolita. Um, like I it was, you know, I've always been into the, those dresses because they're the dresses that I that got me into the fashion that I wanted when I first started liking Lolita. And there was like a perception that they were just like cheap and old and ugly for a long time. Um, and now I think people are coming back and starting to really appreciate those old uh, older trends from a decade or more ago. Um, and there's a big resurgence across the board just in anything that's more than 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And something that's really interesting for us as people who have been in Lolita for a while um, is seeing new people come into the fashion and immediately start to gravitate towards the older styles. Um, like they're trying to buy the older items. Um, they're trying to, you know, like kind of emulate these older street snaps and ways of styling, um, which is very interesting. Yeah, it's been interesting. As somebody who is there like for the first time that a lot of these trends are around, it's really interesting because people are always put, you know, whenever you're reinterpreting the trend, you're always putting your own spin on it and viewing it through kind of modern eyes. And it is so much fun to see people put a new spin on old stuff and bring their modern experiences to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of as an aside, you have done a panel before, which is about how to wear old school now, um, different ways to wear it and like how to style it. Um, which is on YouTube, if anyone wants yeah. to check it out. But if you have more interest in old stuff, you can also just like feel free to message me because I always love talking about old dresses. I cannot overstate that enough. <laughs> but yeah, that is like across all different styles, people are buying more old items um, and styling them in a way that is very nostalgic. Yeah, um, a and here, here's some links, resources. Yeah, here's just a couple links and resources to like place it if you want to learn more about Lolita history. Um, LolitaHistory.com is a website by um, by one of my friends, Rain Dragon, and she has the largest collection of Lolita printed media I've ever seen. Um, and she it's has a library. <laughs> yeah, she has a literal library in her house, basically. Um, and she has scanned all of her magazines and publications back to the 80s and put them all online so you can take a look and just kind of browse and see what old Lolita style guides look like. Um, Effia Lolita is by another friend. Um, it's an old blog. It's no longer updated, but it has a lot of posts about Lolita history, guides, information, um, kind of trend posts as like the trends were happening. If you want to kind of learn about past trends, very cool. Um, if you are more into following Instagram accounts, um, the J Fashion Archives Instagram account um, also posts a lot of um, kind of just scans from GLBs, Kara's, that kind of thing. Um, it goes pretty regularly, so it is fun to just kind of see that content pop up in your feed. And she posts kind of from all eras, like from, you know, the 90s all the way up to the modern day. So it's a great way to see like the full range of Lolita fashion. Mm -hmm. And then this last book. I, I did own this book at some point. I don't worry where it is. It's called Fashioning Japanese Subcultures. Um, it is not just about Lolita. It is about um, a couple of other Japanese um, fashion subcultures that were really popular at the time that this was written. So there is information about gals, about Mori girls, um, and kind of like where they would hang out in Tokyo um, and how kind of the fashions are 
a little bit based in like location as well and how each of these fashions got started and a little bit of history for each of the fashions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and if you have any questions, we'll be doing a short Q&A next. So feel free to stick around and ask away. Yeah, we'll have a time skip and an outfit change, but um, see you in a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> On the flip side. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks but for also see me. you again. See you soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay.